The Medusa by Thomas Ligotti 1. Before leaving his room, Lucian Dregler transcribed a few stray thoughts into his notebook. The sinister, the terrible, never deceive. The state in which they leave us is always one of enlightenment, and only this condition of vicious insight allows us a full grasp of the world, all things considered, just as a frigid melancholy grants us full possession of ourselves. We may hide from horror, only in the heart of horror. Could I be so unique among dreamers, having courted the Medusa, my first and oldest companion, to the exclusion of all others? Would I have her respond to this sweet talk? Relieved to have these fragments safely on the page rather than in some precarious mental notebook, where they were likely to become smudged or altogether effaced, Dregler slipped into an old overcoat, locked the door of his room behind him, and exited down a series of staircases at the back of his apartment building. An angular pattern of streets and alleys was his usual route to a certain place he now and then visited, though for time's sake, in order to waste it, that is, he chose to stray from his course at several points. He was meeting an acquaintance he had not seen in quite a while. The place was very dark, though no more than in past experience, and much more populated than it first appeared to Dregler's eyes. He paused at the doorway, slowly but unsystematically removing his gloves, while his vision worked with the faint halos of illumination offered by lamps of tarnished metal, which were spaced so widely along the walls that the light of one lamp seemed barely to link up and propagate that of its neighbor. Gradually, then, the darkness sifted away, revealing the shapes beneath it, a beaming forehead with a glitter of wire-rimmed eyeglasses below, cigarette-holding and beringed fingers lying asleep on a table, shoes of shining leather which ticked lightly against Dregler's own as he now passed cautiously through the room. At the back stood a column of stairs coiling up to another level, which was more an appended platform, a little brow of balcony, than a section of the establishment proper. This level was caged in at its brink, with a railing constructed of the same rather wiry and fragile material as the stairway, giving the area the appearance of a makeshift scaffolding. "'Good evening, Joseph,' Dregler said to the man, seated at the table beside an unusually tall and narrow window." Joseph Glear stared for a moment at the old gloves Dregler had tossed onto the table. "'You still have those same old gloves,' he replied to the greeting, then lifted his gaze, grinning. "'And that overcoat!' Glear stood up and the two men shook hands. Then they both sat down and Glear, indicating the empty glass between them on the table, asked Dregler if he still drank brandy. Dregler nodded and Glear said, "'Coming up!' before leaning over the rail little ways and holding out two fingers in view of someone in the shadows below. "'Is this just a sentimental symposium, Joseph?' inquired the now-uncoated Dregler. "'In part. Wait until we've got our drinks, so you can properly congratulate me.' Dregler nodded again, scanning Glear's face without any observable upsurge in curiosity. A former colleague from Dregler's teaching days, Glear had always possessed an open zest for minor intrigues, academic or otherwise, and an addiction to the details of ritual and protocol, anything pre-formulated and with precedent. He also had a liking for petty secrets, as long as he was among those privy to them. For instance, in discussions, no matter if the subject was philosophy or old films, Glear took an obvious delight in revealing, usually at some advanced stage of the dispute, that he had quite knowingly supported some treacherously absurd school of thought. His perversity confessed, he would then assist and even surpass his opponent in demolishing what was left of his old position, supposedly for the greater glory of disinterested intellects everywhere. But at the same time, Dregler saw perfectly well what Glear was up to, and though it was not always easy to play into Glear's hands, it was this secret counter-knowledge that provided Dregler's sole amusement in these mental contests, for... Nothing that asks for your arguments is worth arguing, just as nothing that solicits your belief is worth believing. The real and the unreal lovingly cohabit in our terror, the only sphere that matters. Perhaps secretiveness, then, was the basis of the two men's relationship, a flawed secretiveness in Glear's case, a consummate one in Dregler's. Now here he was, Glear, keeping Dregler in so-called suspense, 
His eyes, draglers, were aimed at the tall, narrow window, beyond which were the bare upper branches of an elm that twisted with spectral movements under the floodlights fixed high upon the outside wall. But every few moments Dregler glanced at Gleer, whose baby-like features were so remarkably unchanged. The Cupid's bow lips, the cookie dough cheeks, the tiny gray eyes now almost buried within the flesh of a face too often screwed up with laughter. A woman with two glasses on a cork-bottom tray was standing over the table. While Gleer paid for the drinks, Dregler lifted his and held it in the position of a lazy salute. The woman who had brought the drinks looked briefly and without expression at Toastmaster Dregler. Then she went away and Dregler, with false ignorance, said, To your upcoming or recently past event, whatever it may be or have been, I hope it will be for life this time. Thank you, Lucian. What is this, Quintus? Quartus, if you don't mind. Of course, my memory is as bad as my powers of observation. Actually, I was looking for something shining on your finger when I should have seen the shine of your eyes. No ring, though, from the bride? Gleer reached into the open neck of his shirt and pulled out a length of delicate chain work, dangling at the end of which was a tiny rose-colored diamond in a plain silver setting. Modern innovations, he said neutrally, replacing the chain in stone. The moderns must have them, I suppose, but marriage is still marriage. Here's to the Middle Ages, Dregler said with unashamed weariness. And the middle-aged, refrained Gleer. The men sat in silence for some moments. Dregler's eyes moved once more around that shadowy loft where a few tables shared the light of a single lamp. Most of its dim glow backfired onto the wall, revealing the concentric coils of the wood's knotty surface. Taking a calm sip of his drink, Dregler waited. Lucian. Gleer finally began, in a voice so quiet that it was nearly inaudible. I'm listening, Dregler assured him. I didn't ask you here just to commemorate my marriage. It's been almost a year, you know, not that that would make any difference to you. Dregler said nothing, encouraging Gleer with receptive silence. Since that time, Gleer continued, my wife and I have both taken leaves from the university and have been traveling, mostly around the Mediterranean. We've just returned a few days ago. Would you like another drink? You went through that one rather quickly. No, thank you. Please go on, Dregler requested very politely. After another gulp of brandy, Gleer continued, Lucian, I've never understood your fascination with what you call the Medusa. I'm not sure I care to, though I've never told you that. But through no deliberate efforts of my own, let me emphasize, I think I can further your, I, I guess you could say, pursuit. You are still interested in the matter, aren't you? Yes, but I'm too poor to afford Peloponnesian jaunts like the one you and your wife have just returned from. Was that what you had in mind? Not at all. You needn't even leave town, which is the strange part, the real beauty of it. It's very complicated how I know what I know. Wait a second, here, take this. Gleer now produced an object he had earlier stowed away somewhere in the darkness, laying it on the table. Dregler stared at the book. It was bound in a rust-colored cloth, and the gold lettering across its spine was flaking away. From what Dregler could make out of the remaining fragments of the letters, the title of the book seemed to be Electrodynamics for the Beginner. What is this supposed to be? he asked Gleer. Only a kind of passport, meaningless in itself. This is going to sound ridiculous, how I know it. But you want to bring the book to this establishment, said Gleer, placing a business card upon the book's front cover, and ask the owner how much he'll give you for it. I know you go to these shops all the time. Are you familiar with it? Only vaguely, replied Dregler. The establishment in question, as the business card read, was Brothers Books, Dealers in Rare and Antiquarian Books, Libraries and collections purchased, large stock of esoteric sciences and civil war, no appointment needed, member of Manhattan Society of Philosophical Book Dealers, Benjamin Brothers, founder and owner. I'm told that the proprietor of this place knows you by your writings, said Gleer, adding in an ambiguous monotone. He thinks you're a real philosopher. Dregler gazed at length at Gleer, his long fingers abstractly fiddling with the little card. 
Are you telling me that the Medusa is supposed to be a book, he said. Gleer stared down at the tabletop and then looked up. I'm not telling you anything I do not know for certain, which is not a great deal. As far as I know, it could still be anything you can imagine, and perhaps already have. Of course, you can take this imperfect information however you like, as I'm sure you will. If you want to know more than I do, then pay a visit to this bookstore. Who told you to tell me this? Dregler calmly asked. It seems better if I don't say anything about that, Lucian. Might spoil the show, so to speak. Very well, said Dregler, pulling out his wallet and inserting the business card into it. He stood up and began putting on his coat. Is that all, then? I don't mean to be rude, but... Why should you be any different from your usual self? But one more thing I should tell you. Please, sit down. Now listen to me. We've known each other for a long time, Lucian, and I know how much this means to you, so whatever happens or doesn't happen, I don't want you to hold me responsible. I've only done what I thought you yourself would want me to do. Well, tell me if I was right. Dregler stood up again and tucked the book under his arm. Yes, I suppose, but I'm sure we'll be seeing each other. Good night, Joseph. One more drink, offered Gleer. No, good night, answered Dregler. As he started away from the table, Dregler, to his embarrassment, nearly wrapped his head against a massive wooden beam which hung hazardously low in the darkness. He glanced back to see if Gleer had noticed this clumsy mishap, and after merely a single drink. But Gleer was looking the other way, gazing out the window at the tangled tendrils of the elm and the livid complexion cast upon it by the floodlights fixed high upon the outside wall. For some time Dregler thoughtlessly observed the wind-blown trees outside, before turning away to stretch out on his bed, which was a few steps from the window of his room. Beside him now was a copy of his first book, Meditations on the Medusa. He picked it up and read piecemeal from its pages. The worshipants of the Medusa, including those who clog pages with insights and interpretations such as these, are the most hideous citizens of this earth and the most numerous. But how many of them know themselves as such? Conceivably, there may be an inner cult of the Medusa, but then again, who could dwell on the existence of such beings for the length of time necessary to round them up for execution? It is possible that only the dead are not in league with the Medusa. We, on the other hand, are her allies, but always against ourselves. How does one become her companion and live? We are never in danger of beholding the Medusa. For that to happen, she needs our consent. But a far greater disaster awaits those who know the Medusa to be gazing at them and long to reciprocate in kind. What better definition of a marked man, one who has eyes for the Medusa, whose eyes have a will and a fate of their own? Ah, to be a thing without eyes. What a break to be born a stone. Dregler closed the book and then replaced it on one of the shelves across the room. On that same overcrowded shelf, leather and cloth pressing against cloth and leather, was a fat folder stuffed with loose pages. Dregler brought this back to the bed with him and began rummaging through it. Over the years, the file had grown enormously, beginning as a few random memoranda, clippings, photographs, miscellaneous references which Dregler copied out by hand, and expanding into a storehouse of infernal serendipity, a testament of terrible coincidence, and the subject of every entry in this inadvertent encyclopedia was the Medusa herself. Some of the documents fell into a section marked facetious, including a comic book which Dregler picked off a drugstore rack that featured the Medusa as a benevolent superheroine who used her hideous powers only on equally hideous foes in a world without beauty, Others belonged under the heading of Irrelevant, where was placed a three-inch strip from a decades-old sports page, lauding the winning season of Mr. Sick Medusa. There was also a meager division of the file which had no official designation, but which Dregler could not help regarding as items of true horror. Prominent among these was a feature article from a British scandal sheet, a photoless chronicle of a man's year-long suspicion that his wife was periodically possessed by the serpent-headed demon, a senseless little guignol which terminated with the wife's decapitation while she lay sleeping one night and the subsequent incarceration of a madman. 
One of the least credible subclasses of the file consisted of pseudo-data taken from the less legitimate propagators of mankind's knowledge, renegade scientific journals, occult anthropology newsletters, and publications of various centers of sundry studies. Contributions to the file from periodicals such as the X Centaur, a back issue of which Dregler stumbled across in none other than Brother's books, were collectively categorized as Medusa and Medusans, sightings and material explanations. An early number of this publication included an article which attributed the birth of the Medusa, and of all life on Earth, to one of many extraterrestrial visitors, for whom this planet had been a sort of truck stop or comfort station en route to other locales and other galactic systems. All such enlightening finds Dregler relished with a surly joy, especially those proclamations from the high priests of the human mind and soul, who invariably relegated the Medusa to a psychic underworld where she served as the image par excellence of romantic panic. But unique among the curiosities he cherished was an outburst of prose whose author seemed to follow in Dregler's own footsteps, a man after his own heart. Can we be delivered, this writer rhetorically queried, from the life force as symbolized by Medusa? Can this energy, if such a thing exists, be put to death, crushed? Can we, in the arena of our being, come stomping out, gladiator-like, net and trident in hand, and, poking and swooping, pricking and swishing, torment this soulless and hideous demon into an excruciating madness, and, finally, annihilate it, to the thumbs-down delight of our nerves and to our soul's deafening applause? Unfortunately, however, these words were written in the meanest spirit of sarcasm by a critic who parodically reviewed Dregler's own meditations on the Medusa when it first appeared twenty years earlier. But Dregler never sought out reviews of his books, and the curious thing, the amazing thing, was that this item, like all the other bulletins and ponderings on the Medusa, had merely fallen into his hands unbidden, in a dentist's office of all places. Though he had read widely in the lore of and commentary on the Medusa, None of the material in his rather haphazard file was attained through the normal channels of research. None of it was gained in an official manner, none of it foreseen. In the fewest words, it was all a gift of unforeseen circumstances, strictly unofficial matter. But what did this prove exactly that he continued to be offered these pieces to his puzzle? It proved nothing exactly or otherwise, and was merely a side effect of his preoccupation with a single subject. Naturally, he would be alert to its intermittent cameos on the stage of daily routine. This was normal. But although these fines proved nothing rationally, they always did suggest more to Dregler's imagination than to his reason, especially when he pored over the collective contents of these archives devoted to his oldest companion. It was, in fact, a reference to this kind of imagination for which he was now searching as he lay on his bed. And there it was a paragraph he had once copied in the library from a little yellow book entitled Things Near and Far. There is nothing in the nature of things, the quotation ran, to prevent a man from seeing a dragon, or a griffin, a gorgon, or a unicorn. Nobody, as a matter of fact, has seen a woman whose hair consisted of snakes, nor a horse from whose forehead a horn projected, though very early man probably did see dragons, known to science as pterodactyls, and monsters more improbable than griffins. At any rate, none of these zoological fancies violates the fundamental laws of the intellect. The monsters of heraldry and mythology do not exist, but there is no reason in the nature of things nor in the laws of the mind why they should not exist. It was therefore in line with the nature of things that Dregler suspended all judgments until he could pay a visit to a certain bookstore. 2. It was late the following afternoon, after he emerged from day-long doubts and procrastinations, that Dregler entered a little shop squeezed between a gray building and a brown one. Nearly within arm's reach of each other, the opposing walls of the shop were solid with books. The higher shelves were attainable only by means of a very tall ladder, and the highest shelves were apparently not intended for access. 
back numbers of old magazines, Blackwoods, The Spectator, The London and American Mercuries, were stacked in plump, orderless piles by the front window, their pulpy covers dying in the sunlight. Missing pages from forgotten novels were stuck forever to a patch of floor or curled up in corners. Dregler noted page 202 of The Second Staircase at his feet, and he could not help feeling a sardonic sympathy for the anonymous pair of eyes confronting an unexpected dead end in the narrative of that old mystery. Then again, he wondered, how many thousands of these volumes had already been browsed for the last time? This included, of course, the one he held in his own hand, and for which he now succumbed to a brief and absurd sense of protectiveness. Dregler blamed his friend Gleer for this subtle aspect of what he suspected was a farce, a far larger and cruder design. Sitting behind a low counter in the telescopic distance of the rear of the store, a small and flabby man with wire-rimmed eyeglasses was watching him. When Dregler approached the counter and lay the book upon it, the man, Benjamin Brothers, hopped alertly to his feet. "'Help you?' he asked. The bright tone of his voice was the formal and familiar greeting of an old servant. Dregler nodded, vaguely recognizing the little man from a previous visit to his store some years ago. He adjusted the book on the counter, simply to draw attention to it, and said, I don't suppose it was worth my trouble to bring this sort of thing here. The man smiled politely. You're correct in that, sir. Old texts like that worth practically nothing to no one. Now down here in my basement, he said, gesturing toward a narrow doorway, I've got literally thousands of things like that. Other things, too, you know. The bookseller's trade called it Benny's Treasure House. But maybe you're just interested in selling books today. Well, it seems that as long as I'm here... Help yourself, Dr. Dregler, the man said warmly, as Dregler started toward the stairway. Hearing his name, Dregler paused and nodded back at the book dealer. Then he proceeded down the stairs. Dregler now recalled this basement repository, along with the three lengthy flights of stairs needed to reach its unusual depths. The bookstore at street level was no more than a messy little closet in comparison to the expansive disorder down below, a cavern of clutter, all heaps and mounds with bulging tiers of bookshelves laid out according to no easily observable scheme. It was a universe constructed solely of the softly jagged brickwork of books. But if the Medusa was a book, how would he ever find it in this chaos? And if it was not, what other definite form could he expect to encounter of a phenomenon which he had avoided precisely defining all these years, one whose most nearly exact emblem was a hideous woman with a head of serpents? For some time he merely wandered around the crooked aisles and deep niches of the basement, Every so often he took down some book whose appearance caught his interest, unwedging it from an indistinct mass of battered spines, and rescuing it before years rooted to the same spot caused its words to mingle with others among the ceaseless volumes of Benny's Treasure House, fusing them all into a babble of senseless, unseen pages. Opening the book, he leaned a threadbare shoulder against the towering, filthy stacks and after spending very little time in the cloistered desolation of that basement, Dregler found himself yawning openly and unconsciously scratching himself, as if he were secluded in some personal sanctum. But suddenly he became aware of this assumption of privacy which had instilled itself in him, and the feeling instantly perished. Now his sense of a secure isolation was replaced, at all levels of creaturely response, by its opposite. For had he not written that personal well-being serves solely to excavate within your soul a chasm which waits to be filled by a landslide of dread, an empty mold whose peculiar dimensions will one day manufacture the shape of your unique terror? Whether or not it was the case, Dregler felt that he was no longer, or perhaps never was, alone in the chaotic treasure house. But he continued acting as if he were, omitting only the yawns and the scratchings. Long ago he had discovered that a mild flush of panic was a condition capable of seasoning one's more tedious moments, so he did not immediately attempt to discourage this probably delusory sensation. However, like any state dependent upon the play of delicate and unfathomable forces, Dregler's mood or intuition was subject to unexpected metamorphoses. 
and when Dregler's mood or intuition passed into a new phase, his surroundings followed close behind. Both he and the treasure house simultaneously crossed the boundary which divides playful panics from those of a more lethal nature. But this is not to say that one kind of apprehension was more excusable than the other. They were equally opposed to the likings of logic. Regarding dread, intensity in itself is no assurance of validity. So it meant nothing, necessarily, that the twisting aisles of books appeared to be tightening around the suspicious bibliophile, that the shelves now looked more conspicuously swollen with their soft and musty stock, that faint shufflings and shadows seemed to be frolicking like a fugue through the dust and dimness of the underground treasure house. Could he, as he turned the next corner, be led to see that which should not be seen? The next corner, as it happened, was the kind one is trapped in rather than turns, a cul-de-sac of bookshelves forming three walls which nearly reached the rafters of the ceiling. Dregler found himself facing the rear wall like a bad schoolboy in punishment. He gazed up and down its height, as if contemplating whether or not it was real, pondering if one could simply pass through it once one had conquered the illusion of its solidity. Just as he was about to turn and abandon this nook, something lightly brushed against his left shoulder. With involuntary suddenness he pivoted in this direction, only to feel the same airy caress now squarely across his back. Continuing counterclockwise, he executed one full revolution until he was standing and staring at someone who was standing and staring back at him from the exact spot where he, a moment before, had been standing. The woman's high-heeled boots put her face at the same level as his, while her turban-like hat made her appear somewhat taller. It was fastened on the right side, Dregler's left, with a metal clasp studded with watery pink stones. From beneath her hat a few strands of straw-colored hair sprouted onto an unwrinkled forehead. Then a pair of tinted eyeglasses, then a pair of unlipsticked lips, and finally a high-collared coat which descended as a dark, elegant cylinder down to her boots. She calmly withdrew a pad of paper from one of her pockets, tore off the top page, and presented it to Dregler. "'Sorry if I startled you,' it said. After reading the note, Dregler looked up at the woman and saw that she was gently chopping her hand against her neck, but only a few times and merely to indicate some vocal disability. Laryngitis, wondered Dregler, or something chronic. He examined the note once again and observed the name, address, and telephone number of a company that serviced furnaces and air conditioners. This, of course, told him nothing. The woman then tore off a second pre-written message from the pad and pressed it into Dregler's already paper-filled palm, smiling at him very deliberately as she did so, how he wanted to see what her eyes were doing. She shook his hand a little before taking away hers and making a silent, scentless exit. So what was that reek Dregler detected in the air when he stared down at the note, which simply read, regarding M? And below this word-and-a-half message was an address, and below that was a specified time on the following day. The handwriting was nicely formed, the most attractive Dregler had ever seen. In the light of the past few days, Dregler almost expected to find still another note waiting for him when he returned home. It was folded in half and stuffed underneath the door to his apartment. Dear Lucian, it began, just when you think things have reached their limit of ridiculousness, they become more ridiculous still. In brief, we've been had. Both of us. And, by my wife no less, along with a friend of hers, a blonde-haired anthropology prof whom I think you may know, or know of, at any rate she knows you, or at least your writings, maybe both. I'll explain the whole thing when we meet, which I'm afraid won't be until my wife and I get back from another jaunt, eyeing some more islands, this time in the Pacific. I was thinking that you might be skeptical enough not to go to the bookstore, but after finding you not at home, I feared the worst. Hope you didn't have your hopes up, which I don't think has ever happened to you anyway. No harm done in either case. The girls explained to me that it was a quasi-scientific hoax they were perpetrating, a recondite practical joke. If you think you were taken in, you can't imagine how I was. Unbelievable how real they made the whole ruse seem to me. But if you got as far as the bookstore, you know by now that the punchline to the joke was a pretty weak one. 
The whole point, as I was told, was merely to stir your interest just enough to get you to perform some mildly ridiculous act. I'm curious to know how Mr. B. Brothers reacted when the distinguished author of Meditations on the Medusa and other ruminative volumes presented him with a hopeless, worthless old textbook. Seriously, I hoped it caused you no embarrassment, and both of us, all three of us, apologize for wasting your time. See you soon, tanned and pacified by a South Sea Eden, and we have plans for making the whole thing up to you. That's a promise. The note was signed, of course, by Joseph Glear, but Glear's confession, though it was evident to Dregler that he himself believed it, was no more convincing than his lead on a bookstore Medusa, because this lead, which Dregler had not credited for a moment, led further than Glear, who no longer credited it, had knowledge of. So it seemed that while his friend had now been placated by a false illumination, Dregler was left to suffer alone the effects of a true state of unknowing. And whoever was behind this hoax, be it a true one or false, knew the minds of both men very well. Dregler took all the notes he had received that day, paper-clipped them together, and put them into a new section of his massive file. He tentatively labeled this section, Personal Confrontations with the Medusa, either real or apparent. 3. The address given to Dregler the day before was not too far for him to walk, restless peripatetic that he was, but for some reason he felt rather fatigued that morning, so he hired a taxi to speed him across a drizzle-darkened city. Settling into the spacious dilapidation of the taxi's back seat, he took note of a few things. Why, he wondered, were the driver's glasses, which every so often filled the rearview mirror, even darker than the day? Did she make a practice of thus admiring all her passengers? And was this backseat debris, the L-shaped cigarette butt on the door's armrest, the black apple core on the floor, supposed to serve as objects of his admiration? Dregler questioned a dozen other things about that routine ride, that drenched day, and the city outside where umbrellas multiplied like mushrooms in the grayness, until he grew satisfied with his lack of a sense of well-being. Earlier he was not concerned that his flow of responses that day would not be those of a man who was possibly about to confront the Medusa. He was apprehensive that he might look on this ride and its destination with lively excitement, or as an adventure of some kind. In brief, he feared that his attitude would prove, to a certain extent, to be one of insanity. To be sane, he held, was either to be sedated by melancholy or activated by hysteria, two responses which are always and equally warranted for those of sound insight. All others were irrational, merely symptoms of imaginations left idle, of memories out of work. And above these mundane responses, the only elevation allowable, the only valid transcendence, was a sardonic one, a bliss that annihilated the visible universe with jeers of dark joy, a mindful ecstasy. Anything else in the way of mysticism was a sign of deviation or distraction, and a heresy to the obvious. The taxi turned onto a block of wetted brownstones, stopping before a tiny street-side lawn overhung by the skeletal branches of two baby birch trees. Dregler paid the driver, who expressed no gratitude whatever for the tip, and walked quickly through the drizzle toward a golden-bricked building with black numbers, 202, above a black door with a brass knob and knocker. Reviewing the information from the crumpled piece of paper he took from his pocket, Dregler pressed the glowing bell button. There was no one else in sight along the street, its trees and pavement fragrantly damp. The door opened, and Dregler stepped swiftly inside. A shabbily dressed man of indefinite age closed the door behind him, then asked in a cordially nondescript voice, Dregler? The philosopher nodded in reply. After a few reactionless moments, the man moved past Dregler, waving once for him to follow down the ground floor hallway. They stopped at a door that was directly beneath the main stairway leading to the upper floors. In here, said the man, placing his hand upon the doorknob. Dregler noticed the ring, its rosewater stone and silver band, and the disjunction between the man's otherwise dour appearance and this comparatively striking piece of jewelry. The man pushed open the door and, without entering the room, flipped a light switch on the inside wall. To all appearances, it was an ordinary storeroom cluttered with a variety of objects. 
Make yourself comfortable, the man said, as he indicated to Dregler the way into the room. Leave whenever you like. Just close the door behind you. Dregler gave a quick look around the room. Isn't there anything else? he asked meekly, as if he were the stupidest student of the class. This is it, then? he persisted in a quieter, more dignified voice. This is it, the man echoed softly. Then he slowly closed the door, and from inside Dregler could hear footsteps walking back down the hallway. The room was an average, understairs niche, and its ceiling tapered downward into a smooth slant where angular steps ascended upward on the other side. Elsewhere, its outline was obscure, confused by bedsheets shaped like lamps or tables or small horses, heaps of rocking chairs and baby chairs and other items of disused furniture, bandaged hoses that drooped like dead pythons from hooks on the walls, animal cages whose doors hung open on a single hinge, old paint cans and pale turps speckled like an egg, and a dusty light fixture that cast a gray haze over everything. Somehow there was not a variety of odors in the room, each telling the tale of its origin, but only a single smell pieced like a puzzle out of many. Its complete image was dark as the shadows in a cave, and writhing in a dozen directions over curving walls. Dregler gazed around the room, picked up some small object, and immediately set it down again, because his hands were trembling. He found himself an old crate to sit on, kept his eyes open, and waited. Afterward, he could not remember how long he had stayed in the room, though he did manage to store up every nuance of the eventless vigil for later use in his voluntary and involuntary dreams. They were compiled into that increasingly useful section marked Personal Confrontations with the Medusa, a section that was fleshing itself out as a zone swirling with red shapes and a hundred hissing voices. Dregler recalled vividly, however, that he had left the room in a state of panic after catching a glimpse of himself in an old mirror that had a hairline fracture slithering up its center, and on his way out he lost his breath when he felt himself being pulled back into the room but it was only a loose thread from his overcoat that had gotten caught in the door. It finally snapped cleanly off, and he was free to go, his heart livened with dread. Dregler never let on to his friends what a success that afternoon had been for him, not that he could have explained it to them in any practical way, even if he desired to. As promised, they did make up for any inconvenience or embarrassment Dregler might have suffered as a result of, in Gleer's words, the bookstore incident. The three of them held a party in Dregler's honor, and he finally met Gleer's new wife and her accomplice in The Hoax. It became apparent to Dregler that no one, least of all himself, would admit it had gone further than that. Dregler was left alone with this woman only briefly, and in the corner of a crowded room. While each of them knew of the other's work, this seemed to be the first time they had personally met. Nonetheless, they both confessed to a feeling of their prior acquaintance without being able or willing to substantiate its origins. Although plenty of mutually known parties were established, they failed to find any direct link between the two of them. Maybe you were a student of mine, Dregler suggested. She smiled and said, well, thank you, Lucian, but I'm not as young as you seem to think. Then she was jostled from behind. Whoops, said a tipsy academic and something she had been fiddling with in her hand ended up in Dregler's drink. It turned the clear, bubbling beverage into a glassful of liquid rose light. "'I'm so sorry. Let me get you another,' she said, and then disappeared into the crowd. Dregler fished the earring out of the glass and stole away with it before she had a chance to return with a fresh drink. Later in his room, he placed it in a small box, which he labeled Treasures of the Medusa." but there was nothing he could prove, and he knew it. 4. It was not many years later that Dregler was out on one of his now famous walks around the city. Since the bookstore incident, he had added several new titles to his works, and these had somehow gained him the faithful and fascinated audience of readers that had previously eluded him. Prior to his discovery, he had been accorded only a distant interest in scholarly and popular circles alike, but now every little habit of his, not least of all his daily meanderings, had been turned by commentators into typifying traits and defining quirks. Dregler's walks, stated one article, are a constitutional of the modern mind, urban journeys by a tortured Ulysses sans Ithaca. 
Another article offered this back cover superlative, the most Baroque inheritor of existentialism's obsessions. But whatever fatuosities they may have inspired, his recent books, A Bouquet of Worms, Banquet for Spiders, and New Meditations on the Medusa, had enabled him to grip the minds of a dying generation and pass on to them his pain. These words were written, rather uncharacteristically, by Joseph Glear in a highly favorable review of New Meditations for a philosophical quarterly. He probably thought that his notice would revive his friendship with his old colleague, but Dregler never acknowledged Glear's efforts, nor the repeated invitations to join his wife and him for some get-together or other. What else could Dregler do? Whether Glear knew it or not, he was now one of them. And so was Dregler, though his saving virtue was an awareness of this disturbing fact. And this was part of his pain. We can only live by leaving our soul in the hands of the Medusa, Dregler wrote in New Meditations. Whether she is an angel or a gargoyle is not the point. Each merely allows us a gruesome diversion from some ultimate catastrophe which would turn us to stone. Each is a mask hiding the worst visage, a medicine that numbs the mind. And the Medusa will see to it that we are protected, sealing our eyelids closed with the gluey spittle of her snakes, while their bodies elongate and slither past our lips to devour us from the inside. This is what we must never witness, except in the imagination, where it is a charming sight. And in the word, no less than in the mind, the Medusa fascinates much more than she appalls, and haunts us just this side of petrification. On the other side is the unthinkable, the unheard of, that which should not be, hence the real. This is what throttles our souls with a hundred fingers. Somewhere, perhaps in that dim room which caused us to forget ourselves, that place where we left ourselves behind amid shadows and strange sounds, while our minds and words toy like playful, stupid pets with diversions of an immeasurable disaster. The tragedy is that we must steer so close in order to avoid this hazard. We may hide from horror only in the heart of horror. Now Dregler had reached the outermost point of his daily walk, the point at which he usually turned and made his way back to his apartment, that other room. He gazed at the black door with the brass knob and knocker, then glanced down the street at the row of porch lights and bay windows which were glowing madly in the late dusk. Looking skyward, he saw the bluish domes of street lamps, inverted halos, or open eyes. A light rain began to sprinkle down, nothing very troublesome, but in the next moment Dregler had already sought shelter in the welcoming brownstone. He soon came to stand before the door of the room, keeping his hands deep in his pockets of his overcoat and away from temptation. Nothing had changed, he noticed, nothing at all. The door had not been opened by anyone since he had last closed it behind him on that hectic day years ago, and there was the proof, as he knew somehow it would be. That long thread from his coat still dangled from where it had been caught between door and frame. Now there was no question about what he would do. It was to be a quick peek through a hand-wide crack, but enough to risk disillusionment and the dispersal of all the charming traumas he had articulated in his brain and books, scattering them like those peculiar shadows he supposed lingered in that room. And the voices... Would he hear that hissing which heralded her presence as much as the flitting red shapes? He kept his eyes fixed upon his hand on the doorknob, turning it gently to nudge open the door. So the first thing he saw was the way it, his hand, took on a rosy, dawn-like glow, then a deeper twilight crimson as it was bathed more directly by the odd illumination within the room. There was no need to reach in and flick the light switch just inside. He could see quite enough, as his vision, still exceptional, was further aided by the way a certain cracked mirror was positioned, giving his eyes a reflected entrance into the dim depths of the room. And in the depths of the mirror, a split image, something fractured by a thread-like chasm that oozed up a viscous red glow. There was a man in the mirror. No, not a man, but a mannequin, or a frozen figure of some kind. It was naked and rigid, leaning against a wall of clutter, its arms outstretching and reaching behind, as if trying to break a backwards fall. Its head was also thrown back, almost broken-necked. Its eyes were pressed shut into a pair of well-sealed creases, 
two ocular wrinkles which had taken the place of the sockets themselves, and its mouth gaped so widely with a soundless scream that all wrinkles had been smoothed away from that part of the old face. He barely recognized this face, this naked and paralyzed form which he had all but forgotten, except as a lurid figure of speech he once used to describe the uncanny condition of his soul. But it was no longer a charming image of the imagination. Reflection had given it charm, made it acceptable to sanity, just as reflection had made those snakes and the one who wore them picturesque and not petrifying. But no amount of reflection could have conceived seeing the thing itself, nor the state of being stone. The serpents were moving now, coiling themselves about the ankles and wrists, the neck, stealthily entering the screaming man's mouth and prying at his eyes. Deep in the mirror opened another pair of eyes, the color of wine-mixed water and through a dark, tangled mass they glared. The eyes met his, but not in a mirror, and the mouth was screaming but made no sound. Finally he was reunited, in the worst possible way, with the thing within the room. Stiff inside of stone now, he heard himself think. Where is the world? My words. No longer any world, any words. There would only be that narrow room and its two inseparable occupants. Nothing other than that would exist for him, could exist, nor in fact had ever existed. In its own rose-tinted heart, his horror had at last found him.